Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Starting in verse, thir verse 13, we'll read through verse 16. And y'all bear with me. I left the house this morning knowing I forgot something, and once I got here, I figured out what it was. Thankfully, it wasn't my Bible and my notes. It was just my glasses. So I may have to get Sean to come up here and read for me. Right, <laughs> right, you're right, and it may be that way, we'll find out. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13, we'll go through verse 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Father and our God, again, I, I humble myself before you to say thank you for another day of life. Thank you, Father, for another opportunity to stand before these people and, and share your word. I pray, Father, that you would give me the words to speak, that you would bind up my opinions, Father, that you would provide everything that needs to be said this morning from your word. I just pray, Father, for your guidance and your direction for each one of us. I, I thank you this morning for, uh, for Samuel, Father, and the courage that you give him to, to come up here to this microphone and, and just be obedient, Father, to just... Uh, to just sing a song, and I, I thank you for that. I thank you that we were uh, allowed to be a part of that and see that, Father, and experience that. I pray, Father, that you would give each one of your children, big and small, that same courage to just be obedient. Father, we thank you. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, there's a lot to be said um, in today's times about, about society and where it is and, and the condition um, of the society that we live in and, and the things that are perceived and believed and the, the way people handle things and the way things are treated and, and just, you know, it's just, it's just a mess, right? Our society is a mess. We can't decide what bathroom to go to. Nobody wants to be called a man or a woman and you get to choose and it, you don't have a baby boy no more. You just have a baby because he gets to pick what gender he's going to be and all that garbage. It's just a mess. And I blame us. I blame the church. I believe that our society and our world is in such a disarray because our church is. The church as a whole. Christian people don't act like Christians anymore. We look and act just like everybody else, right? We've been given a purpose. In, in the scriptures we just read, we, we've been given a purpose. We are called to be salt as Christians. It's our job. See, salt has purpose, right? Right? It either seasons or it preserves, right? You can put salt on, on food and make it taste better, no matter whose kitchen it's in, right? I can remember being a kid and helping uh, my uncle. He'd kill hogs every winter, and my responsibility, I lived close enough by, I could get there on my bicycle, and he had a meat house, a salt house, and he would put those hams in, in bacon, and I mean not bacon, but the hams in the salt boxes. And it was my day to go, my job every day to go down there and take those hams and cover them back up with salt and roll them around and rub them down. And I got paid in pork chops. <laughs> we done that. Salt, salt is a preservative, right? It has a purpose. You and I have been called to be salt. We were just told you are salt of the world. It's our job as Christians to season and preserve this world. Now think about that for a moment. 
And think about how that purpose has been completely lost. As Christians, our job is to season, to add something to this world that's missing, right? Or to preserve, to keep it from getting too far in a certain direction. In, in this case, to keep it from getting too far in ungodliness. It's our job to add the godliness, preserve the godliness. And we've lost that, and that's how we've gotten to where we are today. Is, is the church is not salty. That's not good. I don't know if you caught that part, but salt that doesn't have saltiness, according to Scripture, is good for nothing. That's scary. That's scary to me. So let's go through this and see if we can decipher this out. First of all, we start off right here in, in the middle of Matthew chapter 5. Not really the middle, but we're not at the beginning. And the beginning of Matthew chapter 5 is Jesus teaching the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the meek and blessed are the... Right? And, and, and this is Jesus himself teaching this. Well, if you go back and read the end of that, uh, verse 11, it says, Blessed are you... Uh, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All right, so this persecution that Jesus is talking about is inevitable. As a Christian, as a follower of Christ, just like they did the prophets of old, as a follower of Christ, Christ, you will be persecuted. One of the things that has stopped you and I from being salty is the fact that we may get persecuted. Listen, we were told you will be persecuted. It's going to happen. It's going to take place. Matter of fact, he said they've always persecuted God's children. It's just part of the deal. Then he goes into you is the first word that we read starting in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. Well, I went on a little venture to try to figure out who you is in this particular case. And a lot of people have a lot of different opinions and, and, and try to determine who he's talking to directly. Some people say he was talking to just his disciples. And some people say he was talking uh, to all the followers. Here's what's important. Whether it was his disciples, we're supposed to be disciples of Christ, right? Right? Or it was all of the followers. We're supposed to be followers of Christ, right? So in my opinion, if you're a Christian, he's talking to you. In other words, he's not talking to the world. That's, what, that's all that matters. He's talking to the church. He's talking to his followers. He's talking to believers in Christ. Christians. The church. You are to be salt. We, as the church, are called to be salt, to add flavor to this world, to preserve it from going too far, to preserve it from rotting. If you take that same meat that as a child, I went into that salt house and rolled around in that salt, and you just throw it in there and leave it, what happens to it? It'll just rot. It'll just ruin but because you've rolled it in that salt, and my wife will throw a fit that I'll tell you this, but because after so many days in that salt, I'd take my pocket knife every once in a while and get me a little bonus. It was edible. It was edible. That hard, crusty part on the outside, that's good stuff. It's edible. Because of that salt, it keeps it, not only keeps it from rotting, but it gives it something that it didn't have before it was rolled in that salt. That's our job. As Christians, that's our job, is to give it something it don't have. Keep it from rotting away in this world. That's our job. That's what we're called to do, is be salty. Add something to this environment that you're in every day. Stop blending in and looking like everybody else in the world, right? That's not salt. You're just a part of the meal. And listen, it's all falling down and rotting out from under you and we're standing here going, why? Why, God? He's going, because you ain't salty. You ain't adding nothing. You ain't providing anything. You're not preserving. You're just letting it rot. He has all the answers to stop everything that we see. 
He has everything required to call people to him. He's just asking us to be a little salty, to point them in that direction. That's our calling. It's our job. It's our purpose. We'll look at it here in a little while. He says in his word to be imitators of God. You know, that's, that's specific to us. That's, that doesn't, God is not surprised at what this world is. He's not surprised that they lie, cheat, and steal to get everything they want, right? I mean, they don't have the foundation you and I have. They don't have the expectations you and I have. He's not surprised that they react out of their emotions. And it's a roller coaster, and one day it's this way, and the next day it's that, and then back to this. He's not surprised by any of that. He's not even, I would say he's not even disappointed because it's expected. But what he is taken aback by, what he is disappointed in is that he looks at his children and sees the same thing. Because we're called to something different. We're called to be salt. We're supposed to be salty. We're supposed to be adding something that's missing instead of complaining about why it's not there. It's our job to add that. It's our job to walk out this Christian life in a way that other people see it and it has an impact on them. But when we leave the doors of the church, when we leave the buildings that we gather in and we act like and respond like and go along with everything the world does, there's no salt. And according to what we just read, an unsalty Christian... It's useless. Good for nothing. Good. As a matter of fact, in the time and place that this was, was written, when, when, when Jesus said these things, in the area he was in, salt was a little different than what you and I think of today. Today, our salt, for the most part, is mined. Theirs is found, still to this day in that country, theirs is found in salty lakes, in marshes. And it, and it dries up, the water dries up at times and they go in and gather this salt and they take it out in bricks and the part that is laid out there and been exposed to the sun and the elements has lost its flavor. They break it open and the saltiness is inside. That outside shell is useless because it's lost its saltiness and they literally throw it in the roads. They u literally use it to build roads. They walk on it. It's not fit to be thrown into a field because it'll kill things, vegetation and such. It's not good enough to be put into recipes and brought into the house to be used as salt's purpose. It's not strong enough for that. So it's just thrown in the road and people walk on it. A Christian who's not salty can do more harm than good. Right? Because we blend in and make everybody around us think there's nothing different in them and I except they get up early on Sunday mornings and I sleep in. And that's detrimental to what, what we're trying to do here, right? Because we're trying to draw people into this thing. We're trying to point them to God. And when we act like they act, they see no difference and they go, well, I don't need what he's got. I thought, I mean, I'm better than he is. This message is for anybody that is a Christian. You. He goes, I want to read the part where he tells us about being trampled underfoot. Keep reading with me. Um, hang on, the wind's messing with me. There we go. You are salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its tastiness be restored? In other words, what do you use to salt your salt? It's kind of standalone, ain't it? You can't add that back to it. Once it's lost, it's gone. Keep going. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet.
Remember, this is a comparison between salt and Christians. We've been called to be salty. And as Christians, if we've lost our saltiness, we're no good. We're doing more harm than good. So I think it's important that you and I understand what makes us salty. Where does our saltiness come from? Where does this flavor come from? Where does this preservative come from? What does it look like? Am I salty or have I lost my saltiness? How will I know? Well, I tried my best to find it in lists. So let's go to Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, which everybody for the most part should be familiar with. Um, that is our list of the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22, and we may go beyond that. Now, because I'm starting in the middle, and verse 22 starts with the word but. That's a connecting word, meaning it's referring back. And just before this, if you go back to verse, I think, 19 and read up to this point, you get a list of things not to be involved in as a Christian. Starting in verse 22, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So what does saltiness look like? What is it that God's expecting us to put on display when He says for us to be salt of the world? Well, this is a, a part of that. These fruits of the Spirit. Look at this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, right? These are the things that you and I should be putting on display in order to be... They're what's lacking from our society, right? As a matter of fact, they're not only lacking, they've been renamed and getting abused. When they approved gay marriage across the country, you know what their thing was? Love wins. Wrong, sin wins. Amen. See, they don't even know what love is because they've never been plugged into real, genuine, godly love. Amen. And it's what you and I are supposed to be putting on display. That love comes with more than just cuddles. Right? God's love comes with a little discipline too, don't it? Anybody ever been disciplined out of love? My dad was the expert in that. He knew it was coming. He was laughing before I said it. <laughs> but the love that's on display in our society today doesn't come with anything that might tell you no. Right? As a matter of fact, we don't turn the scoreboards on until they get up to this big so they don't know what it's like to lose. Everybody gets a trophy so nobody gets their little feelings hurt. That's not love. That's set up for failure. Because I hate to tell you, at some point in this walk of life, you're going to be told no. Whether your mama does it or you wait till you... Listen, mamas, you're killing us. You're killing us. we got to put up with them rascals once you send them out into this world. Right? They ain't never been told no. You ain't never popped their hand. I came walking through with this this morning. And all the kids that didn't shiver when they seen it, I went, you ain't never been whooped. You ain't never been whooped. You... <laughs> Look, there was a couple of them, and I was just walking like this, and they went, I said, yeah, you had that. You know what that is. My daughter was one of them. She was going. <laughs> You're killing us. Love says no from time to time, right? And when he's talking about peace and joy, he's not talking about that joy. is not that self-fulfillment that we're all um, looking for, that, that, self that happiness, whatever makes you happy. That's not this. And the reason the world doesn't know what these things are is because we haven't put them on display. 
We haven't stood up and said, that's not love. We haven't stood up and said, that's not what peace looks like. We haven't pointed at it and said that's not self-control. They don't know what these things are because you and I as Christians don't display them. We don't put them on display. Remember, we're told to put our good works on display. So why? So we can be lifted up? So God can be glorified. It's our goal in life as Christians that everything we do glorify God so that others can see Him being glorified and be turned to Him. It's not so I can be patted on the back. It's not so somebody can come tell me what a great job I've done or what a great life I'm living. It's so God can be glorified and others can see that and be drawn to that. And desire that. But when you and I as Christians lose our saltiness and we don't put salt on display and we're not making a difference in this world and in our environment and in our society, we get what we've got today. It's why it looks like it does. It's why people are so confused. Everybody's scared to stand up and call wrong, wrong. We're scared to point at it and say, hey, that's sin and God don't allow it and I won't be a part of it. Because we might get ridiculed. We may, get, we may lose our job. It may cost us something. Christianity should cost you something. Look what it cost God. And you think we're going to walk through it without sacrifice? That doesn't make sense to me. And you know, we're very fortunate by the grace of God that we live where we live because the things that other people in this world are sacrificing in order to be called Christian is a lot more than being laughed at or left out or talked about. It's costing some of them their lives. They, they're really meeting on Sundays in fear that they may not make it back home because somebody found out they were studying the Bible and come and took their life. When was the last time that happened to you? We're so blessed and so, so, so just because of God's grace. And it, that's all it is, is God's grace. Yet we sit back and let it get to where it's at today. Keep going with me. Go back over. <clears throat> Some of the other things that need to be displayed along with the fruits of the Spirit, is God's grace, right? It's okay to let people know that you believe that you are where you are because God chose it that way. We shouldn't be ashamed of that. It's okay to share the gifts that God has given us with others, just like, just like little Samuel did this morning. Just come up here and share whatever God's laid on your heart. Hey, he just comes up and goes, I want to sing. And he was, he was pretty persistent about it and gets that opportunity and just puts it on display. Why in the world would you take what God's given you and hide it somewhere? The purpose of you having it is so you'll share it and other people will see it and it'll point them to God. These things need to be put on display. The grace of God needs to be shared. The gifts of God needs to be shared. The blessings of God, it needs to be shared. People need to know and understand that this stuff doesn't come because I busted my rear end and worked all the time. It came because God has blessed me. The only reason I even have a job is because He chooses it that way. He chose for me to have it and I should get up every morning and be thankful. I'm sorry, God. Instead of griping and complaining and then getting there and looking like everybody else that's in that place. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to stand out. We ain't supposed to use the language they use. We ain't supposed to tell the old crazy, nasty, junky jokes they tell. We're, not, we're supposed to be different in every aspect of life. That's what saltiness is. We're supposed to be preserving. We're supposed to be adding a flavor that don't already exist. Blending in don't accomplish that. And when salt loses its saltiness, how do you salt it? It's good for nothing but to be thrown out in the streets and trampled underfoot I don't know about you but that don't sound very appealing to me that don't sound like a place I want to be in I don't want to see what God's example of me as salt trampled underfoot looks like so in order to avoid that I got to remain salty I got to continue to be salt look we live in a dark world what's the next thing he tells us 
Back at Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. You know what happens when darkness is introduced to light? You ever went into a room and flipped the light on and watched darkness seep out the cracks? Now what happens to darkness when light appears? That quick, it's gone. I mean completely gone. It has to check out. So why is there so much darkness in this world we live in? It's our job, it's our calling, it's our responsibility to be the light in this dark world. God did not tell us He was going to set us up in a place where it wouldn't be tough and it wouldn't be hard. Matter of fact, Jesus warned all of His followers, it's going to be hard. <laughs> Look how they treat me. How do you think they're going to treat you? And then He gives us a command to be light. You are light in this world. You are in a dark world and I put you here. And guess what? Here's the great thing. Darkness does not have a choice. Right? Darkness don't have a choice. When the light comes on, it has to leave. Now you may have a shadow here and there and a little bit, but it ain't nothing like being in a... Y'all ever been down to any of them cavern places, Cumberland Caverns or... Uh, we've been to two or three of them, different places, Virginia and Tennessee, and they take you down. I mean, you'll be seven, eight, nine hundred foot underground, and they'll go, now y'all gather up all your kids, we're going to cut the lights off. And they cut the light off, and you honestly cannot see your hand. The only reason you know you're doing this is because your brain tells you it is. You can't prove it. But when they turn that light back on, you know what happens? All that darkness, I mean pitch black, total darkness, nothing can be seen. It's gone. As soon as they turn the light on, it's gone. When you and I are the light we are called to be in this world, darkness has no choice. It has to leave. So it is not that we're trying real hard and we just ain't good enough. It's that we ain't trying. We ain't turned the light on. When was the last time you shined your light in this world? When was the last time somebody questioned your beliefs? For most of us, we can't remember that far back. Because we'd rather just be quiet and let them do what they're going to do and we're going to do what we're going to do and this is how we get what we've got outside of this building. It's where it came from. It's us not being salty and us not being light. Christians have went dark. We're fading away. And when we fade, there is no hope for this world. God does not have any other means to reach this world except His people, right? He's done sent Christ. They either listen to Him or they don't. The only hope our lost loved ones have is that we reach them, that people reach them. Remember the, 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 the man that, that got sent to hell and, and, and looks up and, and goes, can I just go back and tell them? Can I, just, can I just go back and warn them? As he's laying in Abraham, he didn't get sent to hell, he looked in, he's laying in Abraham's bosom. And he goes, can I just, can I just tell them? And he goes, they done been told. They've got the prophets. They've got everything you had. He is in hell. Yeah. I done got myself confused, Kevin. The man's in hell. I know he is. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Heathen. Yeah, and he's begging for water, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Now the story's all coming back. My point is that he's already done been there, and he asked, can he go back and warn his loved ones, and the answer is no. They've done been told, just like you were told. So listen to me. The only thing these people have that don't know Jesus is you and I. God uses us. His plan, is, His intentions is to use us to share this. Now, I don't want you to walk out of here this morning thinking, I told you, you are a great source of light. As light, you stink. As light, I stink. There's only one source of saltiness and light, and it ain't individuals. <laughs> so in order for me to have light, i got to be plugged into the source, right? That's, that's where the light comes from and the purpose of me even being able to share that light and be light in this world is to send people back to that source. 
We got to where we are as a nation, as a society, as a culture, because Christians quit caring. We don't care anymore. That's the truth. When was the last time you felt motivated to share Christ with somebody just out of the thought that they may be lost? We don't care. I mean, if we did, wouldn't there be more light? <laughs> wouldn't there be more salt? Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. I think. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 12. Heck, that ain't right. Oh, I'm in Galatians. That's why it ain't right. I knew it wasn't right. I thought maybe them glasses thing I was about was shown. I should have just left my Bible at home too because I can't read it. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore... Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. Right? Drop on down to verse 8. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead... Expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Don't, don't have nothing to do with anything that looks like darkness. But instead, expose darkness to light. You know why you want to expose darkness to light? What happens when light comes into a dark room? Darkness leaves. Things that are in light are visible. Make it visible. In other words, don't coddle it and cuddle up to it and name it something different. Call it what it is. Expose it. Sin is sin. Discern it and avoid it if it's darkness. Stay away from it. Don't touch it. Don't cuddle up to it. Don't rub on it. Don't, don't just stick your finger in it. Don't, don't mess with it. It's darkness. Leave it alone. Stay away from it. You're called to be light. You ain't got no business playing with darkness. If, if you're salty, be salty. If you ain't, good luck. Because according to Scripture, once it's lost its salt, it's good for nothing but to be trampled underfoot. You are light of the world. Look at the purpose of light. Let's go back one more time. We're going to flip a couple more times. We're about done. If you are light of the world, city, a city set on the hill cannot be hidden. Look at this. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. The purpose for you being light isn't so you can light up your world, so you can light up the world. Look at this. But put it on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. 
The purpose of light is to put it on display so it can light up as much as it can possibly light up. Right? So it can chase out as much darkness as it can possibly chase out. Put it on a stand. Put it up high so that it forces the light out. I mean the darkness out. Keep going. We got purpose in this. In the same way, let your light shine before others. So just like you would take a lamp and light it and put it on a stand so that it can light the whole house. In the same manner, look at this. In the same manner, let your light shine before others. Not hidden, not covered up, not sitting in the floor, on a stand. Put your light on display. Why? Because that's where it's most effective. How did we get where we are today? Because you ain't put your light on a stand. Because you've been dabbling with darkness. Because you've been putting it under a basket because you know it exposes things. And you know that when things get exposed, people talk about them. And it may embarrass you and they may make fun of you and they may so what? Be the light. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah and amen. That may be some of them sounds ain't nobody else ever heard before, you know? The Bible talks about that. We might be getting the first fruit this morning. Put your light on a stand so that it can light the whole house. The reference to a city on a hill. Right? We've got a lamp on a stand that lights the whole house and we've got a city on the hill. What makes that city on the hill visible? The light of the individual houses, right? You know what makes this group of people the city on the hill? It's the light of the individual. Our effectiveness as a group is based on the effectiveness of each individual. So quit hiding your light. Quit acting like the rest of the world. Quit looking like the rest of the world. Quit imitating the rest of the world. They living in darkness because they ain't got no light. You ain't got that excuse. You have a source of light. <clears throat> Look at here. So that... Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. See, ultimately, that's our purpose, is to glorify God. That's why we were put here. Every one of us. So this being a light thing is more than just changing the world. It's about seeing our God get glorified. Because see, in and of yourself, you have no light. In and of myself, I have no light. If I'm not plugged into the source of light, there is no light in me. This isn't my light that I'm sharing. This isn't my light that I'm putting on a stand. This isn't my light that I decide to hide under a basket. Right? It's God's light. God's given it to me. How happy you think He's going to be that I lived in darkness because the whole time I had light under my basket. See, it's not your light that you're mishandling. It's His light. One more and we'll quit. Ephesians 4.32. We may quit. We may not. Remember, I've been studying this for three weeks. I've got a whole lot. Ephesians 4.32. What does it look like when we let our light shine? The subtitle in uh, my 
Bible, starting at verse 17, says the new life. And this is, this is a, a great place to, to sit and read. If you don't have a place to start your, your daily reading this afternoon or this week, I, I would, this would be a great place to, to look in, in Ephesians chapter 4. But I won't go all the way over to 42, and it says, I mean 32. And it says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God has forgiven you. You know what it looks like when we put God's light on display? It looks like what God would do. You know, we read a scripture in 2 Corinthians this morning in Sunday school that told us to capture our thoughts and obey Jesus. What it looks like when our light is shining is what it would look like if Jesus was present. Right? That's what we're trying to imitate. Remember earlier, be imitators of God. This ended with, just as God has forgiven you. This, this ideal that is, that is widespread in our society about God being just this great, big, loving, forgiving God that there ain't no way he'd ever let anything bad happen to anybody. There's no way that's true. And I'm not trying to portray that this morning at all. But at the same time, he's an awful loving God, right? He's a mighty forgiving God, right? And we're supposed to put those things on display too. And I didn't want you to think that I was preaching this morning that if you ain't a mean Christian, you ain't a Christian. <laughs> There's a way to go about this correction thing. There's a way to go about it. But the main thing is is getting your light out from under that basket and putting it on display. Let the world see the love of God shine through you. Let the world see the fruits of the Spirit boiling out of you. Put those things on display. Be salty. Be salty. You were called to be salt of the earth. You were called to be light of the world. Again, it's not your flavor. It's Jesus' flavor. It's not your light. It's Jesus' light, but you still got to put it on display. You can't keep it hid. That's how we got to where we are today. And again, it's not, it's not always about hammering that out and, and, and fighting it out in the street and letting everybody see that you fought it out for God. That ain't how it works. There's a lot of love and forgiveness and tenderheartedness and kindness and gentleness and all those things. Sometimes you just got to stand up for what God says stand up for. You just got to call sin, sin. You just got to look at it and go, you know what? That looks like darkness to me. I'm going to stay over here. Sometimes, because you're the light that you're called to be, because you're the salt that you're called to be, then you get to experience what it's like to see things changed. You get to see what it's like when God steps in and really, really changes things. Is he willing to do that in the society we live in today? I don't have any idea. But it's worth a shot if Christians will just act like Christians and quit acting like the rest of the world. If Christians will just go back to being salty, just go back to being light, maybe we can see some kind of an improvement. But now remember, this ain't heaven. We're living in a cursed world, right? It's always going to be broken, right? I mean, you, you think that things like Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, what eventually happened to Lazarus? He died. He died. He, right. He died again. <laughs> right. So this world is cursed. It is broken. And I'm not saying we should expect this place to be what we're looking forward to being a part of, but we can get better than we are right now. We can draw people closer to God. We can see a society changed. If nothing else, maybe we can just see individual households changed. Individual families changed. Then you look up and we're a city on a hill. But every bit of this starts with me. As an individual. Not as a pastor. Not as a Sunday school teacher. Just me, just regular old everyday Nick. I got to be willing to be a light. I got to be willing to be salty. 
I got to be willing to, to endure some things for the cause of the cross. 